a 1,000-year-old community that was once a model of Native American culture and shared communal living, gone. How was it that a town that triumphed in sporting competition was completely wiped out, and now all that remains are its ghostly ruins at the bottom of one of America's largest lakes? June 1934. North Dakotans throwing the banks of the Missouri River on both sides for the opening of the Four Bears Bridge, a moment captured in time in still photography, the excitement and hope evident for all to see in the faces of the crowd. Built on the Berthold Indian Reservation, the bridge was named for two chiefs of the three united tribes that made up the reservation's land, Manden, Hidatsa, and Arakara, both of whom shared the name Four Bears. To mark the occasion, a stone obelisk is erected as a monument to the new connection of the land and the tribes who had lived on that land for a millennium, not only managing to maintain their traditions and way of life through the ages, but also thriving in the increasingly changing world of the early and middle 20th century. Many of the people in the photograph were born into a time before airplanes and motor cars, but they would live to see the atomic bomb, the moon landing, and the arrival of computers. November 2005, with Lake Sakakoea at historic lows, the few drivers that patronize its shore roads are surprised by the appearance of an odd shape rising out of the water. What appears at first to be an alien artifact, or perhaps some broken fragment of a shipwreck, is in fact the top of the Four Bears Bridge Monument, a ghostly reminder of a lost community and a lost dream. How was it that the thriving Native American communities who assembled in that June sunshine to mark a great step forward for their people had disappeared and vanished, the only evidence of their centuries-long presence, a spooky monolith, rising from the dark and muddy waters. Before we answer that question in the following video, if you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. The small North Dakota town of Elba Woods was a thriving community in the 1930s and 40s. The people who grew up at that time remember a life that revolved around hard work and harsh winters, but one that was above all happy. The Fort Berthold Indian Reservation had been created in 1870, following from the signing of the Fort Laramie Treaty 19 years earlier in 1851. The land within the reservation evolved and shrank over the following decades, but by the time that the Elbowitz Four Bears Bridge began construction in 1930, life on the reservation seemed very settled. Tribesmen in traditional dress are pictured at the opening of the bridge, holding aloft the American flag. Elbowoods was established in the closing decades of the 1800s, when residents of the Lake of Fishuk village moved following outbreaks of smallpox in the area, as well as conflict with the Sioux Nation. The town took its name from the literal description of its location, being situated in a bend of the Missouri River, where it turns like an elbow from south to east by a wooded area. By the 1940s, it was a center of a three tribes community, hosting a boarding school, hospital, Indian agency headquarters, and a jail. Though successive renegotiations and seizures meant that the reservation was smaller than the 12 million acres at its creation, following the 1887 Dawes Act, the 1890s had seen the tribes awarded what were called allotments in an effort to move away from the traditional collective lifestyle of the tribes and toward individualist farming in the United States model. Each head of a household was awarded 160 acres, while single adults and children were given smaller portions. Livestock, like cattle, cows, sheep, and pigs were introduced, and the arable crops grown were traditional corn, along with oats, wheat, barley, squash, beans, peas, and turnips. Children attended school regularly from the 19th century, and Martin Cross Jr., a native of Elbowoods, recalled that the Catholic Church was very important for the Indian people during the next decades. The church at Elbowoods was a large, picturesque building, with a capacity for the residents of the town along with the inhabitants of the nearby areas. Accounts of those who lived in the town during the 1930s and 40s seemed to paint a picture of a life that involved a lot of hard work for both adults and children. Not unusual for towns of Elbowood size at the time, but one that had successfully adapted to the necessities and demands of the 20th century, while also maintaining its distinctive culture and communal spirit. Despite having a population of only 200 and a basketball court so small that its free throw circle was set to intersect the middle line, in 1942, the town's basketball team, the Warriors, reached the final of the Class B state championship under the tutelage of their coach, Leon Wall. Though they lost by a point, it was still a significant achievement for such a small Native American community with virtually no resources or even the means for its supporters to travel to games. The Warriors lost the game by a point, but it was discovered that their opponents, the Lakota Raiders, had fielded an ineligible player, while at the same time, the Warriors had kept one of their regular players, who was similarly ineligible, on the bench. The board decided to declare the result null and void and registered Elbowoods as the winners by default. 
but they refrained from crowning the Warriors champions with the excuse that it would cause unrest amongst the other teams that had played Lakota earlier in the tournament. Unfortunately, the disappointment of the basketball championship, in spite of Elbowood's dedication to fair play, proved to be a harbinger of much greater heartbreak. Beginning in the early to middle 1940s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers moved onto the Three Tribes Reservation land and began construction on what would eventually become the Garrison Dam. The Army ignored the protests of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara that reservation land was protected by treaty and cited the law of eminent domain, continuing their work in spite of the opposition of the families who legally owned the land. The dam project was part of a larger government program to both control the potential for flooding along the Missouri River, as well as create employment from both the construction work itself and the electricity that would be generated once the Army had completed construction of the dam. Flooding on the Great Rivers was a serious concern, particularly following the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, which had killed close to 500 people as well as destroying property and displacing hundreds of thousands of people. Now faced with an existential threat to their own lives, the three tribes were forced to take their case directly to Washington, D.C. Congress compelled the Army to negotiate with the tribes, and both parties put forward alternatives to the construction of the dam and the inevitable flooding of the tribal lands that would follow it. Unfortunately, the Army's offer to replace the tribal territories and towns with new land of similar size was unacceptable, while the tribe's suggestion of a possible replacement site for the dam was also turned down by the Army. Throughout the negotiations, construction work continued on tribal lands, and Native American representatives felt that this had an intimidatory effect on the locals, as well as discouraging many into thinking that the project was a foregone conclusion. Congress eventually settled the matter unilaterally in 1947 by awarding $5 million compensation to the tribes for the loss of their homes, though this rose to $12 million following the appointment by the tribes of an outside assessor who valued the suitable compensation at closer to $22 million. The tribes were also denied a share of the electrical output of the dam that would soon flood the valley, wiping out their farms, and they were banned from fishing and hunting on the lake and its vicinity, as well as grazing their animals or using the wood and timber in the area as they had done for 1,000 years. Chairman George Gillette wept at the signing ceremony for the purchase of the 150,000 acres to construct the dam in May 1948. Insufficiently recompensed for the loss of their homes and livelihoods, 325 families, about 80% of the affiliated tribe's members, began the process of relocation, in many cases hoisting their homes, the buildings of their towns, and even the graves of their loved ones onto trailers or rolling logs and hauling them to their new locations, all at their own expense. The Four Bears Bridge was relocated, as was the town's church, where it stood forlornly isolated for 70 years until an arsonist burned it down in 2019. Many of the institutional holdings of Elbow Woods were reconstructed at a site called Newtown, which today has a population of 2,000. The village communities and rural networks of the past were irrevocably broken, however, and many of the people who had enjoyed accessibility to the larger tribal community found themselves living in isolated settlements, the new Lake Sakakawea cutting off the routes around the now much diminished area of the Fort Berthold Reservation. By the middle of the 1950s, the lake had flooded the towns of Elbow Woods, Sanish, and part of Old Hook, and claimed fully 94% of the tribe's agricultural lands. In the wake of the dam's construction, unemployment on the reservation reached 70%, and many were affected by despair. The community worked hard to build a new life, helped somewhat by the discovery of North Dakota oil in the 1950s, and today, Newtown hosts many of the tribal centers that were once situated in Elbow Woods. The Elbow Woods Memorial Health Center is located on College Drive, and the town contains a community college, water department, and an office of public works. The Four Bears Casino is also built on reservation land. In a happy conclusion to one nagging aspect of Elbow Woods history, the town's basketball team also finally received their trophy a full 60 years after the fateful final game with Lakota, when they were named 1942 Class B champions at the 2002 Finals. Though the ceremony righted a historical wrong and showed that the community was not forgotten, the town of Elba Woods and its beautiful surrounding lands still lay under the cold waters of Lake Sakakawea, the only glimpse of its lost and ghostly past rising to the surface when the waters are low, or else viewed in the grainy footage of the town when it was a thriving and prosperous center for the three tribes of the Fort Berthold Reservation. Today, the focus of educators in the three tribes centers on teaching younger generations that think the giant lake near their home has always been there of their ancestral heritage and the unique historical legacy of their people. For others, the lost town of Elbow Woods remains an intriguing example of the impermanence and unpredictability of fate, as well as the preciousness of life. 
For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.